Sean, I think New Zealand military shouldn't be anywhere near the Ukraine. And if New Zealand soldiers want to turn mercenary, they should certainly quit the military first, says Nathan. Yeah, and Nathan, that is the interesting thing. Reading between the lines of the reports we have about a New Zealand soldier killed in the Ukraine, though not on the front line in the Ukraine, it appears he was on a leave of absence from Burnham and that the military in New Zealand at least have some knowledge of maybe up to 500 New Zealanders moonlighting as fighting soldiers in Ukraine. So how does this work? What are the protocols? And is this an area or is this an area that needs to have some light shed on it? Well, well look, we had him on the program recently and, and I gotta say he called it completely right on the LAVs, because then we had the Ukrainian ambassador saying, oh, we don't care if they haven't got spares, give them to us if you've got spare LAVs. It was quite an interesting uh, development that. Um so we're going back to former Defence Minister of former New Zealand First MP, former soldier, of course, uh, Ron Mark. Ron, uh, welcome back to the platform, mate. How are you? G'day. Uh, yeah, well, we've had better days, Sean, but uh, yeah. yeah, not bad. So, look, I, I'm intrigued by this story. We have a New Zealand soldier, apparently from Burnham, who was killed in, in Ukraine, and it seems that in some way our military know he's there, even though he's on... Leave. Can you explain for, I don't know, uh, an idiot like me, what's gone on here, what the situation is? Yeah, I'll, I'll start, Sean, as I said to your guys um, before we came on air, that I've not been authorised by the family to talk about uh, the circumstances of uh, their, their loved one who's deceased, um, but I am trying uh, where I can to, to assist and... Um, what will be an exercise in so you have been in contact his with his family you do you do know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah, his, bro his brother his brother talks to him. Yeah. okay all right yeah so so ron I, I read in the paper i read in the media that there are perhaps hundreds of new zealand service personnel who are in well, fact in uh, ukraine yeah. ukraine yeah well that's probably a huge exa exaggeration look i can i can say for certain that there are hundreds of new zealanders have made inquiries um, uh, you know, wanting to serve and you know, this goes back a few months um, you know, people were clearly incensed by the atrocities that they saw on their television screens in Butcher. The images were pretty graphic and pretty inflammatory and there's some good New Zealanders out there who you know, like some of us can get frustrated sitting at home watching things happening and not being able to do anything about it. And um, yeah, that's the reason I went to Ukraine is because mm -hmm. I failed to help some people who were trying to get out of Mariupol and sitting here did not seem to me to be an option. And so, you know, I've done four, four I've helped on four missions too from from home by working virtually as a, as a staff officer on a phone and on a PC and I've done two missions in theatre and and without a doubt, I will go back again. And hey, when you say you've do done it, two missions in theatre, Ron, what do you mean? Well, it means I've been to Ukraine and I've delivered humanitarian aid to Frontline, okay. along with, um, with as an ambassador, as an appointed ambassador for the Great Society Commission, which is an evangelistic um, okay. uh, organisation. You know, a Great Commission Society. Okay, so yeah. those are and humanitarian missions, they are not military yeah. missions. Yeah. Yeah, but look, uh, here's what I have noticed is that there are people who have gone over initially with that intent. They have gone over and not so much, and, and it's, I think it's quite a sensible approach. They, they will work out the risks as best they can with disjointed information, lacking in information, lacking in support and violence. So when they ask for assistance, they're told, and this is not, I'm not talking about serving soldiers, I'm talking about New Zealanders in general, most of whom have done, had military experience or have been first responders in some way or have worked in uh, UN um, missions, you know, and Red Cross missions around the world. These are people who are used to this environment. Of course, there's a few Walter Middies and there's a few drunks who take it in the head to do something and, yeah. and you know, they, they never eventuate. But the people who go initially seem to go over wanting to help. A lot go into, there are those who go into humanitarian aid like myself, like Owen Pormana, mm. like Tenby Powell and, mm. and a bunch of others. Um, most seem to have military backgrounds. Most go, and then there are those who go in and they get, 
in a position where they know they can help the locals, the National Guard, territorial type soldiers, and they can provide them some basic medical training so they can treat combat-related uh, trauma wounds, so they can know how to look after themselves in the field, and so they know how to shoot a firearm. And then, you know, things morph. And before you know it, you, you've made friends with Ukrainian people. You've met up with other expats. You meet like binder people. You see atrocities. You see things that infuriate you and just it's simply run against the grain of everything you've taught and been and learned as a, as a New Zealander. And you end up in a frontline position. And there have been those people who have transitioned through that phase, their original attempt, not necessarily go there to fight, but that's where some of them ended okay, up. Okay, so Ron, I want to ask you, without reference to the grieving family and the person has just been lost, because I understand the sensitive visit around that, are you telling me that we have New Zealand Defence Force personnel, New Zealand soldiers, who have taken leaves of absence from their jobs in New Zealand, their roles in New Zealand, and are currently on the front lines in Ukraine. No, I'm not telling you that. I'm okay, telling you that clearly, that clear, clearly the media are reporting that there's one. Okay. And, and do you have information or do you have suspicions that, that, that there are others? No, I have no information that there are okay. others. But what I do, what I do know, Sean, is that there are a lot of, there are a number, and it's not in the hundreds. It's just yeah. all that. Okay. I know at one time there were four hundred and fifty people trying yeah. to get information, um, but no, it's not in the hundreds, yeah. and and it's not a flood of defence force personnel taking okay. leave and going. Right. Um, so, so Ron, one. can you tell me from your knowledge and your former Minister of Defence? What is the attitude of the New Zealand Defence Force to people who might take a leave of absence and take off on an adventure like this? Uh, look, uh, to be honest, I haven't uh, spoken to the, um, Major General Boswell. Uh, I've talked to a few senior people. Um, but um, I, th I think right now, I can tell you this, right now the attitude is one of grief. Um, he's yeah. one of theirs. Yeah. He's one of theirs, and they will treat him like a son, like a brother, like a sister, um, and, you know, their desire... Does right that now, mean his presence there was home. condoned by New Zealand Defence no, Force? Or no, no, I don't, I don't believe that any senior officer knew, and I, and I have no doubt that his mates knew what he was planning, yeah. and that, you know, some of his family might have known, but I don't believe senior... If senior officers... You know, I had senior officers telling me, not to go, you know, when I when yeah. when I was first started making inquiries, you know, just mm. backdrop inquiries to 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 improve my situational awareness, and and the message was very clear: no, don't go, you know, because but they and they're complying with this government's position as good army officers will do. They will mm. do as the government tells them, um, and and they won't break that. You know, mm. that that they're duty bound, but. You know, privately, when people are out of the military, when they take leave without pay, they're on leave without pay, actually, Sean. Mm. They are private citizens who have gone, taken leave. They are no longer serving. They're gone. Mm. Essentially, they've frozen their service. And, you know, when I, when I went to Oman, different story. I mean, ironically, and it's, and it's so much mm. better these days. When we left and the Brits recruited us and we went and joined up in a British sanctioned operation, which actually has produced a longest lasting peace in that country in, in history mm. and, and has seen the development and evolution into a modern state, which is far more a uh, pleasant place to visit than many other places in the mm. Middle East, let me assure you. But when we came home, we were treated like crap. Mm. We were treated like mercenaries. We were, you know, there were, there were those... But you were, two, Ron, those, basically. You were a mercenary. Oh, no. Well, you know, it, it, when you say that word, it's desire, it, it inflames people with little emotions and they well, start... Well, look, I don't mind. I'm a descendant of mercenaries, so it doesn't but, matter. But, <laughs> you know, being, 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 I was, you know, being formally sworn in to His Majesty's Defence Force... Oh, OK, yeah, yeah, I see your point. British government, yeah. ...with the British government support, who had loan service and uh, officers and, uh, you know, seconded officers there as well. That was a different situation to a contractor. 
Mm. Let's put it that way. But, you know, today, as you know, people see experience as being valuable to New Zealand, we can learn from it and we can gain. So I don't believe anyone in the New Zealand defences and the senior ranks within the Defence Force knew, and if they did know, they would have stopped it. Yeah, OK, but, and that's what I'm really driving at. You're telling us but, you do not no. think whatever the participation of New Zealand trained defence personnel, it's not a sanctioned operation, this isn't a backdoor uh, uh, support. Definitely not. Yeah. Definitely not. But, you know, it, and, and, and I just ask people to be conscious when, you know, they're speculating and, yeah. and you know, get out and flaming stories as a family in behind this mm. and they're grieving. Yeah. And he is not, he is not yet home. Yeah. But and if you do, this, yeah, Ron, you would know this, if you do this sort of stuff, even the humanitarian stuff, You've done, and we've talked to people who've done the same thing. There is a risk when you're in a, in a, in a war zone, isn't well, there? Sh Sean, and, you know, some of us have come to terms with our death a long, long time ago. And, and uh, when, when military people who had extensive operational experience do talk about this, if they ever talk about it to other people, they talk about it amongst themselves yeah. and with their direct family. But it astonishes the people I know that they can think like that. They're pragmatic. They're realistic. They do everything they can to understand the risk, to mitigate and offset. They train and prepare and equip as best as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. And they go in with organizations that are good organizations that ascribe to the values and principles of which they were brought up, they learned and were trained under. And they don't associate themselves with the other sort of crap that's yeah. out there. Yeah. But when they stand, uh, sit here at home watching their TV, many of them get to a point and they say, you know, there's no point sitting here crying about it and whining about it. The question is, what are you going to do? And some of these people decide to step forward and they know that if the worst happens, it will happen. The trick is to do everything you can to offset and minimise that chance, you know, and, and that's, been, that's what being a professional person in the military is about. Yep, I hear you. Ron, if we could just divert from that, and once again, I thank you for in some ways representing and reminding people that there is a family here, someone has died, there's natural grief and there's genuine emotion there. I want to come back to the last conversation we had about the LAVs because yesterday, yeah. the day before, we finally got hold of the Ukrainian ambassador in Canberra uh, who gave <laughs> a completely different version of events about the LAVs than the Prime yeah. Minister and Penny Hanari did. And he said, we don't <laughs> care if they haven't got spare parts. They're completely useful to us. We'll take them as is, where is. Um, it seemed yeah. to be a completely different story than what the government's telling us. Yeah, well, you know, I, I took uh, Vasily to a game of rugby at Patoni, uh, to watch my nephew, uh, Patoni, play when he was here. And, you know, it um, doesn't surprise me that you had that interview, Sean. Uh, but, look, people, the government is, you know, seems to seems to be ignorant of the fact that Ukrainians are very adaptable, very uh, innovative, uh, very competent engineers, that the Canadian government has given them LAVs, is giving them spare parts, is supporting them in every way they can with LAVs, that our LAVs were built in Canada, that we left one of these $7.8 million vehicles in Canada so that they would have a reference vehicle when supplying parts for the New Zealand-specific model, which is convenient for Ukraine because if they had our broken ones, they would easily be able to source the spare parts they need from Canada because Canada built and retained yeah. one of our vehicles. Yeah, so it's why do you not... think the government's saying no? Why are we dragging our heels on this? Oh, I guess they just don't like giving people weapons. But, I mean, even even the ambassador said to me, we're going to use this to ferry our troops up to the front lines, but really useful. That's, that's, that's exactly right. And, you know, and armoured personnel carriers, depending on what what brand, what species they are, have a role 
everywhere in, in, in a theatre of war. You, you look at the vulnerable. Here's the irony, Sean. When I was attacking the decision to purchase the LAVs, and, and you may recall all of the corrupt activities that the Army got itself uh, was leading and involved in in that time with Major General Dodson and, and some other officers who to this day I have no time for, um, they... Um, the original intent was to upgrade our M113s. That's the uh, tracked armoured personnel carrier from the Vietnam era. The story that was sold to the public is these were antiquated. They were obviously, they couldn't be used. They couldn't be modified. They couldn't be upgrade, upgraded. Well, that was back in 2002, 2000, around 2000, I think, 2002. Well, guess who just supplied 200 of them to Ukraine? United States yeah, of America. Yeah. And, and how many other countries have given them M113s? Uh, many other countries. And they're still an operational service in Israel and all over the world. Here's the point. If a vehicle is vulnerable to a certain type of attack, you use it to transport troops in other locations where the threat is lower. And the great thing about the... And, and I could give chapter and verse is why the Bushmaster is better than the LAV. But the LAV does have, uh, is a competent vehicle in certain scenarios and could be utilised in those scenarios. You know, that when I travel through Ukraine and I travel from the Romanian border all the way across, uh, out through Butcher um, and to, to the uh, eastern borders, there are many routes there where you would take some vehicles and not others. And the LAV would be a highly useful addition to their armory. Look, that may only be 10, may only be whatever it is right now. Um, they need everything they can get. Whether the, the vehicles arrived there and they pulled them all to pieces to use them as parts to keep other LAVs going, who knows? But let them sort it out, you know. But they're just saying, just give us your vehicles, rubbish ones and all. Give them yep. to us. Yeah, and, and that's we'll right. As is, where is, who's going to argue uh, with yeah, those things? that's right. Yeah. One lady owner, I mean, yeah, when I checked out, when <laughs> I had my briefing as a minister on this, I, I found out there's one that was, you know, I think, well, last time I checked for uh, odometer readings, I found one that had 9,000 uh, so. kilometres on the clock. Yeah. You know, sort of one, one lady owner, uh, yeah. hardly ever used, parked in the garage most of its life, um, yeah. you know. Hey, Ron, I just want to very briefly get back uh, to the passing of this New Zealander uh, in Ukraine. Were they there on their own? Were they with other New Zealanders? Uh, the, uh, look, I, I, I'm not going to talk about him, but I'm going to yeah. say that of all of the um, people I've met over there, there are mixes. There are, there are Kiwis dotted around the place. All right. um, and they are mixed with Aussies, Canadians, um, not so many Aussies, but um, Canadians, Americans, Brits, and and I've got people that, that I know from my time in the military who uh, have got people in there assisting yeah. with training and and teaching uh you know, the biggest issue and the one decision the government did get right was to send the 120 trainers because yeah. the, the training task for ukraine is massive you know they've got everyone from recruits who know nothing about firearms to older men who did their service 10 15 mm. 20 years ago and then you're training uh, specialist people and mm. operating weapons that New Zealand's never owned and it's, you know, and, and it's you Do know, you think we will and ever publicly know who this person was? Are the family going to talk about it at some stage or not? Uh, look, um, yeah, I have no doubt. Uh, well, I understand that one media outlet has already gone to that step and that won't go down well with the family uh, mm. because the family weren't asked and I just look forward to the day when some media people uh, get, maybe you'll be the one to sort it to them but mm. some people need to think more about families before they yeah. chase off. Um, hey, Ron, I, I thank you very much uh, for your time this morning. Give us some context to a story which is easily open to speculation and, and misinterpretation. Sometimes we've just got to wait and see, don't we? Yeah, yeah, that's right, Sean. Hey, yeah. look, uh, well, thanks for this opportunity. To yeah, any time. Thanks, mate. No. That is Ron Mark. He's a former Defence Minister. Former New Zealand soldier, some would say former mercenary. What Ron did, he served in Oman, Sultanate of Oman, as that was going through political upheaval. Uh, and a former New Zealand first MP. So some interesting, I think, insight there. Um,
and he's been in contact with the family, he knows what's going on there, and he says the New Zealand Defence personnel, no matter what the circumstances around this, and we're presuming young man uh, being in Ukraine, he will, he was on a leave of absence or he was not on active duty with the New Zealand Army, he says he's still going to be treated like family by the New Zealand Army, and I guess that is a morale issue. Ron suggesting that reports of hundreds of New Zealand Army personnel taking leave and maybe fighting in Ukraine, probably over-egging it somewhat. But these are grey areas, uh, grey areas that we live in. And I was just thinking, actually, I see I come from a family of mercenaries. My grandfather, my father's father, who was an avowed communist, he tried to join the International Brigade in, um, in Spain and apparently got turned down, tried to go up to Auckland and jump on a ship and get to Spain and join the International Brigade. Government in um, New Zealand at the time, not so into the International Brigade. And because Grandad was a member of the Communist Party, he got turned around, never got on that ship. Uh, and he's a guy who didn't mention World War II, uh, was forbidden to be talking, talked about my dad's uh, home until the day that Hitler invaded Russia, because prior to that was just a war between capitalists. And going even further back, and I may be entirely boring you now, uh, my great-great-great-great-grandfather left Ireland in 1793 to become a mercenary uh, for the French in uh, Catholic uh, regiments in the Imperial French Army and went on, I think, to fight for Napoleon and then swap sides for the British. <laughs> So there's nothing wrong with a bit of mercenary in the family as far as I'm concerned. Genuinely, though, our commiserations and sympathy, a New Zealand family has lost a family member under tragic circumstances and I think they are due our respect and they're due some privacy as they work through that issue. Uh, thanks for Ron Mark coming on at short notice as well to discuss that story.